<laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's, that's another excellent question. And what I'm trying to do is precisely to show that the entire debate hinges on this question. That is to say, if you want to maintain that there is a passivity before activity and passivity in my relation to others, as Levinas does, for example, if, if we construe that as ethical in itself, that it ha has an ethical value in itself, then again I would say we're left with a, either the option that we just assume that the other is good, so it's good to be passive and let them in, or we're advocating a type of ethics of submission. But uh, now, I'm saying that the only way to make sense of the idea of a passivity before activity and passivity is precisely to understand it as the non-ethical opening of ethics. It's true that I'm, before I've done anything, I'm passive. I'm born into the world, I'm like, and, and before I can actively determine anything, I'm thrown, as, as Heidegger says. So there's an irreducible passivity, just as people enter my life and things happen to me before I can decide what I think about them, or if I want them or not. That has always already happened, it's happening. So it's passivity, I insist, must be understood in this sense, and that's why I say, insist on the difference that we can't quit to say like, well, couldn't we call the non-ethical ethical? No, <laughs> like that's the point, that we cannot, and if we do that, we lose the entire force of the argument. But, but, so isn't, but isn't, isn't that just to say, I'm sorry, just to yeah. really quickly, sort of cliches, but isn't that just to say, let's read Levinas in a non-fluffy Anglican vicar kind of way, which is a, a, a yeah, I just have. That, that, that's yeah, I mean, that's the only thing I would say about that. W that would be one way of describing what I'm doing in the Levinas chapter. My problem is that a lot of people who say that they're doing that, anyway, ends up with the type of what I would call the ethical reading, and thereby loses the stake. I, I try to elucidate in my chapter on Levinas that there are all these passages where he talks about alterity, not as the relation to the good beyond being, but precisely in terms of the temporal diachrony and the impossibility of being in itself and how that opens me to both the chance and the threat and so on. And those are very powerful phenomenological descriptions of what it means to be a non-self-sufficient being, what it means to be a being who's susceptible to being visited by others all the time. But we lose the sense and power of those descriptions when we go on and translate that into the ethical, however qualified. It has to be the non-ethical opening of ethics. That's the issue I'm trying to push. Can I just follow that up by saying we might spend a bit of time thinking about the second half of that phrase, because we've been emphasizing yeah, yeah. the non-ethical yeah. opening of ethics, and uh, you know, I think we, we agreed on that. But it is the non-ethical opening of ethics, and so far the only kind of ethics that you've articulated has been the ethics of, of, of limits, of putting some kind of um, limitation on, on the unconditional. Whereas I think for Levinas, and I would say for Derrida, the ethics that arises out of that non-ethical opening is more a question of responsibility, care, and, and, and so on. Yeah. Can I say one more thing? Because the other thing I thought was really interesting was that, and from my agency, was that um, one of the things in Levinas and in Derrida is the sense of agency emerges exactly from that. And sometimes uh, you were talking as if there was a sort of another agent who was then able to rationally judge what hospitality conditional or unconditional was, whereas in fact the agent is created by that very moment of hospitality or the moment of facing. But I mean, it's hard to do when you're talking about it. But yeah, but that's why I insisted that so the, the distinction is only logical and not temporal. Mm. That is to say, it doesn't happen in sequence, but you have to logically distinguish them to understand the structure you're talking about. Uh, but then, but then, but then from where does that logical distinction arise? It arises from thinking through what it means to say that it's impossible for us to be in ourselves, that we're always already with others, always already exposed. It's taking that claim seriously and thinking through what that would mean, uh, rather than pacifying it by emphasizing it. Um, so I just want to say, since this we, there comes, keeps coming back to this, that me, my sort of reactionary and protective tendencies. Uh, and, uh, and again, I. What I'm stressing, is like before you made any choice, you also have limits and conditions and so on just by virtue of being a finite being. And I'm not choosing openness over closure. I'm trying to show their co-implications. In that way, I wouldn't side with either openness or closure. I'm trying to think through their implications. And that means, as you rightly point out, that it's a non-ethical opening of ethics. So indissociable from ethics is this non-ethical opening. And that's what we need to think. I've got a question. Oh, I think it's a question. Uh, question may emerge. Um, the uh, intellectual genealogy question. 
Um, just trying to think through the differences between them, which I think are, are pretty important, and, and I think I know where I stand on them. But, um, there's a kind of forgotten haunting of Levinas' ethics of first philosophy, um, which goes back to, not so much just to Nazi, but to French writing uh, in the 1930s, and academically, of course, in France. Um, and the phrase is uh, the great T.S. Eliot's hero, Charles Moraz, La politique d'abord. And so there's that, that kind of, uh, it comes before, sort of, and seems in many ways to haunt uh, Levinas. Um, and in many ways, your, your co-implication argument seems to me, in terms of an intellectual genealogy, absolutely right, in terms of Derrida mm. rethinking la politique d'abord, mm. re responding éthique d'abord. Mm. Um, but I wondered if, uh, and I don't know, if it's, I suppose this is the kind of question version. Um, in, in thinking about it in that genealogical way, the missing figure, in many ways, in this discussion, and I just wonder if he's, in, in some ways, not a bridge figure, um, is, is Maurice Blanchot, mm. um, in terms of his relationship to uh, Levinas and that question, he had lots of testy issues to do with Levinas's ethics of first philosophy, and whether you could just comment on either the intellectual genealogy issue or, or specifically on where you, where you think that Blanchot would be fit, fit into this question. Do you want to take this first? Well, not really, because I think it's incredibly important <coughs> to both of them. Um, it uh, would, would take a long time to talk about the ways in which he's important, but I, I certainly would put Blanchot centrally. But I want to hear if Martin agrees with that, or if, if you think Blanchot is partly responsible for <laughs> where Derrida gets it wrong. <laughs> well, I, I'm not interested in, in, in assigning blame or, or, or praise, <laughs> uh, <laughs> actually. And uh, that it's a very interesting perspective on the intellectual genealogy of these issues. Now, my work does not primarily go, in, go via that type of intellectual genealogy, but rather sort of to the conceptual, logical issues. And from that perspective, it's less interesting where it came from than what it is, which, which doesn't mean that I don't think it's important to do intellectual genealogy. That's just not the way I work with these texts. And also for strategic reasons, I'm trying to do away with those aspects to get to the core issues uh, and put them in focus. Um, but for an intellectual genealogy, how these things play themselves out in the inheritance of ideas and so on, I think that's a very fruitful perspective, but that's not the way I'm going. We can probably take one or two more questions. Yeah, um, uh, yeah the question of language has come up. Derek mentioned and um, logic has been mentioned a lot. And I'm just struck because, because in, in a sense, I feel like you're both right. And I was thinking about that as you were speaking and how, how it can be that that's the case. Um, and I was thinking about the relationship between philosophy and literature, um, between logic and language, um, not, not, not from the direction of it. Um, the man, Paul Demand, who was basically the most strictest deconstructionist before Martin came along, um, <laughs> argued that, uh, that we couldn't, that language, we couldn't understand language in its performative dimension cognitively. And it, it strikes me that. Those, those passages, like the gift of death, for example, or like the end of our hospitality, where Derrida turns to the logic, if you uh, call it the logic story, literature, um, it, you know, he arguably mo moments of kind of almost the sublime, um, that they, this is part of the tonality that, Der that Derrida is talking about. And I'm just wondering what you think, what you both think about that's the reducibility of, those, of that kind of writing to logic. Mm. Yeah, good question. Um, because we haven't addressed that. Um, and I'm very taken with Martin's uh, project of looking for the logical core. I mean, that's what's so great about this book. Um, be better than any other commentator on Derrida. Yeah. He has really weeded out know, if you want to put it in those terms, all those literary flowers. A <laughs> 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 sort of a backhanded kind of compliment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> something, something wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> literary weeds, then. Um, and I'm very drawn to that, and I think it's, it's, it's absolutely right. But, but the other side of me 
keep saying, well, Derrida didn't write like that, didn't write like Martin Hagelin, didn't write like Paul de Mann. Um And why not? And that's another big question, but it does seem to me important that, and Blanchot is actually indicated here as well, because Blanchot did, doesn't write like Martin Hagelin. Um, <laughs> So I would certainly say that in trying to respond responsibly to Derrida, countersign his signature, which is another metaphor we could have talked about, um, one ought to try to do justice to the literary, to, to, to give it a name that's inadequate in many ways. Um, because Derrida seems to be intent in problematizing his own drive towards logic. So while I, I love his work because he seems to me much more logical and much more rational thinker than many of the others of his era who, who, who run the great pantheon of theory, um, he also is important to me because he, because he writes like that, because he sees in the, the, the literary possibilities of language um, ways of engaging with notions like unconditionality, the uh, impossibility that can't be expressed in straightforward logical terms. And I'd be really interested to hear what Martin has to say. Yeah, I guess at first I have to plead guilty to weeding out the literary flowers, but uh, <laughs> um, that doesn't mean that I don't think the issue of language in Derrida is very important. And the avenue I would suggest uh, from my perspective is the most important, is what, is what I was mentioning before, namely the situational character of what Derrida is, is uh, writing. And, and that situational character works in two senses, I would say. One is that whether he chooses to play up the positive or the negative side, say, this depends very much on what he's responding to on a certain context and so on, and one has to read that entire context to situate those statements. So that's sort of a syntactical, non-logical aspect of what he's doing. Uh, the second sense in which is situation and contextual is that these texts are composed in a way that when you lift certain things out and just say, hey, here's Derrida, he wants us to be unconditionally hospitable, for example, uh, uh, that when you read the entire sequence, and that's the example I took with the ending of Over Hospitality, which ends, I mean, the last two, three pages are really difficult reading because he recounts terrible things, and yet I haven't seen anyone talking about their hospitality, ever quoting these pages, even though everyone quotes what happens 10 pages earlier, uh, when he says something that sounds really great. Uh, uh, or not. Um, so in that way, I would say that um, to understand the way Derrida then works with this logic in the way he writes and in the way he composes his text, we really have to uh, read with that type of attention. But I think that type of attention is often uh, lessened by these types of assumptions that I'm trying to call into question. So in that way you could see that's a sort of propedeutic to actually reading the text in a more powerful and, and demanding way. I just want to thank Martin. Yeah, it's I want to thank you so much. Great this has been fun. Yeah, it's thank been you. wonderful. So productive. Well, so. Uh,